Sumya Basu is a PhD student at Cornell, where he studies distributed systems problems associated with cryptocurrencies. Sumya is advised by Emin Gunsur, a Cornell professor who previously appeared on the show to discuss smart contract security. Sumya joins the show today to talk about a variety of issues in the cryptocurrency space. We first explored the degree to which Bitcoin and Ethereum are actually decentralized. They are probably less decentralized than you think, and this is because of the centralization of mining pools. So much of the transaction processing is centralized in Bitcoin and Ethereum. After talking about decentralization, we got into Sumya's research focus, cryptocurrency networking and block propagation. Bitcoin transactions are collected into blocks. When a Bitcoin full node solves the cryptographic puzzle associated with a block of transactions, that full node broadcasts the new block to all the other nodes in the network. It's important for that block broadcast to be fast and efficient so that the other full nodes in the network can be made aware of the new block as soon as possible, and then they can start working from the updated chain. The problem of making all nodes in the network aware of a new block is known as block propagation. Block propagation can be accelerated through the use of relay nodes. A relay node is a node that is dedicated to communicating these new blocks throughout the blockchain. Sumya is working on a relay node architecture called Falcon, and in this episode we talk about what Falcon is. If you're looking for all 700 episodes of Software Engineering Daily, you can check out our apps on the iOS or Android App Store. We've got tons of episodes on blockchains and distributed systems and business, tons of other topics. And if you want to become a paid subscriber to Software Engineering Daily, you can hear all of our episodes without ads. You can subscribe at softwaredaily.com. And also, all of the code for our apps is open source. We've got a burgeoning open source community. And if you're looking for an open source community to be a part of, please come check us out. We would love to have you involved. Just go to github.com slash softwareengineeringdaily, join our Slack, come hang out with us, and hack on some code together. Also, meetups for Software Engineering Daily are being planned. If you're interested in coming to our meetup in New York or Boston or L.A., you can sign up at softwareengineeringdaily.com slash meetup. And I'm sure we'll have more in the future, so if, even if you don't live in those places, please do sign up. And with that, let's get on with this episode. Users have come to expect real time. They crave alerts that their payment is received. They crave little cars zooming around on the map. They crave locking their doors at home when they're not at home. There's no need to reinvent the wheel when it comes to making your app real time. PubNub makes it simple, enabling you to build immersive and interactive experiences on the web, on mobile phones, embedded into hardware, and any other device connected to the internet. With powerful APIs and a robust global infrastructure, you can stream geolocation data, you can send chat messages, you can turn on sprinklers, or you can rock your baby's crib when they start crying. PubNub literally powers IoT cribs. 70 SDKs for web, mobile, IoT, and more means that you can start streaming data in real time without a ton of compatibility headaches and no need to build your own SDKs from scratch. And lastly, PubNub includes a ton of other real-time features beyond real-time messaging, like presence for online or offline detection, and access manager to thwart trolls and hackers. Go to pubnub.com slash sedaily to get started. They offer a generous sandbox tier that's free forever until your app takes off, that is. PubNub.com slash SE Daily. That's P U B N U B dot com slash S E Daily. Thank you, PubNub, for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Sumya Basu, you are a PhD student at Cornell. Welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So you're doing your PhD at Cornell. What does your research focus on? My research focuses on different aspects of cryptocurrencies. So in particular, I look at things like the network layer and how to make the network layer more efficient so that permissionless cryptocurrencies can run even faster. 
I also look at things like the core consensus engines behind permissioned blockchains and trying to make those faster, more efficient, have better security and privacy guarantees as well. And then I also have a little bit of work looking into the economics behind the transaction fees and things like that. So really, it's kind of dabbling in various aspects of of cryptocurrencies. That term permissioned blockchains, is that what a lot of big corporations are looking at, like to to mediate supply chain and stuff like that? Yes, I think in the settings where you know every player that is important in the consensus engine, I think a permission blockchain makes sense. So in a corporation or in an industry, you know who the players are for the most part. So you can actually just construct a permissioned blockchain and trust sort of the consortium of individuals instead of instead of leaving it completely open. And for those areas with the permission blockchain and you have some trust around people, can you use algorithms that resemble the ones that we have been using in trusted environments for years? Like, for example, what Amazon uses to have DynamoDB reach consensus with its different nodes or... Yeah, I mean, just basically the the kinds of algorithms that, that perform consensus across cloud-based environments. Can you use those kinds of things? No. So this is actually a very new kind of consensus, which has actually been studied for 20-some-odd years at least. And the main difference between Amazon running a highly available cloud service versus a consortium blockchain is this notion of trust. When Amazon is looking at failures, what it's really trying to prevent is some node failing in a weird way. So it's not really looking for nodes that are getting hacked or can do arbitrarily malicious things or nodes that are actively trying to take down the system. Whereas in blockchain, you're really looking at nodes that are actively trying to attack the system. And it's a much more like adversarial environment. And really like the sort of the classical algorithms from the, from the literature for, for something like DynamoDB is Paxos. And for the Byzantine case, it's PBFT, a practical Byzantine fault tolerance. Right. And, and so, so what I was wondering is, because I totally understand that in the environments like Bitcoin, you are looking for a solution to Byzantine failures. That is, failures that can be totally random, totally malicious. They could they could be very non-random and malicious. Basically, the the worst case scenario that a very intelligent Byzantine general would invoke upon your perfect economic system. Yeah, exactly. But it seems like if you have a consortium of banks, for example, that are just trying to create a faster payment network, and they already have a good amount of security around their nodes, it seems like you could have something that is more like Paxos where you have higher expectations for you know the kindness of the different actors that are going to be in play but i guess you you know as you said you could have those nodes still be hacked so maybe you still do want to treat them as byzantine yeah so there's really what i think byzantine fault tolerance tries to solve is this notion of trust and the question is if say wells fargo had the chance to to do something malicious to try and hurt its competitors would it do that? And will it always be nice from now and into the future? It's it's kind of hard to tell. And it's kind of hard to put trust in a particular organization. I'm just picking on Wells Fargo as, as, as an example of a big bank, but r- really this works in any industry. And you can look at things like the thing that you alluded to, which is security. And these different organizations have different levels of security. So some organizations may be more prone to getting hacked than others. They may have different failure models, different levels of security expertise, and so on. So even if you're not looking at sort of the, the malicious case where everyone is is trying to subvert the system for their own profit-seeking ends, it may also just be more prudent to remove this sort of layer of trust. And really, there's a lot of trust that we see in these places. One kind of example I've used in the past is is with Amazon. So when you conduct a transaction on Amazon, you trust Amazon to sort of do, do the right thing, right? So it, to make sure that your, your package gets delivered and to make sure that the payment gets received on the other end. And Amazon charges a premium for that trust. And, the, the, and wherever these kind of trust premiums arise, 
it becomes a use case for blockchain to sort of eliminate mm. that trust. So it's it's really about trust more than sort of fault tolerance in the traditional sense. And that's kind of how mm. I look at this space and kind of the promise behind this space. I see. So I'm really not even look. I'm not even thinking about the the right axis of trade offs. So I would love to talk to you about consortium blockchains, but I did not prepare at all for that topic. So maybe we can save that for a future show. Let's talk a little bit about Cornell because Cornell seems to be pushing itself towards establishing itself as a, a, a university that is open to teaching about cryptocurrencies and taking them seriously, which is the exception rather than the rule. And I think that's, you know, at this point, probably largely because there's just not a lot of academic brain power that has been spent on cryptocurrencies. There's not a lot of universities that have an expertise in cryptocurrencies. Probably we'll we'll see more and more universities develop an expertise, but Cornell has really been at the leading edge, and so so IC3 is a division of Cornell that's dedicated to cryptocurrencies. What are the goals of, of IC3? It really is to pursue sort of the science of blockchains, to figure out what it means, what, what, the, what the use cases are, what are the problems that people are facing now and will face in the future. So it really is about putting a very serious academic brain power behind behind blockchains and and sort of pushing the science of uh, looking at all aspects of blockchains really both permissioned and permissionless and looking at these different models and things that go on and you work under Emin Gunsur I think you're doing your PhD under him what's it like working working with him he's a for people who don't know he's kind of a, a well established maybe I would even use, use the word famous blockchain researcher, professor who has really put a lot of effort into researching cryptocurrencies? Yeah, so I really like working with Goon. He's he's an expert who's been in the blockchain space for a very long time, as in one of the earlier um, efforts of selfish mining was by him. And he's obviously expanded into many other areas since then. I think the main benefit I get, I think, working with someone like Goon is is that he sees sort of what the key problems are in the blockchain space and sort of he can anticipate a little bit what what the technical problems are coming up in the blockchain space and what things are sort of worth spending your time on. And also he knows the right people to sort of talk to so that the work that you're doing has the impact and it reaches the right people who can actually make use of it and turn it into something that helps them. Because at the end of the day, that's really, that, that's, that's part of what, why I do research. You know, in some of the earlier shows of Software Engineering Daily, one of the questions that I explored a lot was, what is the difference between academic research and industry research? Because around this time, I was reading a lot of these papers like the Amazon Dynamo paper or Google MapReduce. And you read these things and you're like, well, this seems like fundamental computer science research. And if industry is putting out this kind of research, you know, what do we need academia for? But then as I've dived into cryptocurrencies a little bit, there are some academics that are saying things that probably are not necessarily incentivized for corporations to say. Like, you know, talking to, oh, well, my good friend Hasib interviewed Goon on this show, and and also there was uh, an interview I did with Joseph Bonneau, who is an, an academic in this space, who is also kind of like Goon in the same way where he's he's very moderate, and he's basically interested in knowledge and teaching other people. And it is that fundamental desire to just teach and to know more about the space rather than to profit in the short term or to become some sort of ideologue. That notion seems very rooted in academia, and it's it's given me a refreshed respect for the the tenets of academia. Yeah, I, I think what you hit on is is one of the core differences, I think, behind academic and industrial research. Industrial research tends to be a little more a profit seeking for the company. So DynamoDB, a great piece of work, but at the end of the day, it was for a, a service that Amazon is providing. It really is to help sort of their internal services and pursue sort of a profit seeking goal. Yeah, so I think in academia, you are encouraged to explore this. And I think the core difference of teaching is really 
uh, like as a PhD student who's kind of at some points thinking about sort of the next steps. I, I think that teaching aspect is really one of the key differences behind academia and industry. Because as an academic, you teach classes and there's this whole like education aspect of the job that that isn't there as much in industry. And, and obviously, the branching out in terms of like academic labs and industry labs, th- these are very broad brushes. And you can find academic labs that operate a little more like industry labs and solve the sort of like uh, problems that you would expect to see solutions in, in coming from industry and also vice versa. You've seen some great industry labs too contributing sort of things that don't really serve a profit-seeking purpose for their respective corporation, but contribute sort of to the fundamentals of computer science. But I think this aspect of teaching is one key difference between industry labs and research labs. My sense is that Cornell in particular is renowned for its distributed systems research and its expertise among professors. Has there been a, a shift in the in the mindset of the distributed systems researchers around Cornell that like, is everybody interested in cryptocurrencies or are there people who are distributed systems experts and are still kind of like, meh, don't really care? I think cryptocurrencies are, are interesting to a lot of distributed systems people just because it, it is very much like if, when you're talking about Byzantine consensus and sort of the early works done in that space, like both consensus, I guess, in the Byzantine sense and in sort of the, 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 the normal fault tolerance, I guess you could say, with, with Paxos. A lot of that work was pioneered here at Cornell. So bringing that distributed systems expertise to blockchains is something that, that definitely I see a lot of systems professors here at Cornell, even if they're not sort of, not every project they're doing is in blockchain. A lot of systems professors here have a couple of projects going on in the cryptocurrency space and in the blockchain space, just because it is a very good a motivating application uh, to look at for sort of the, the next innovations in this space. If you love Software Engineering Daily, I think you'll also love the Google Cloud Platform podcast. It's a podcast about Google Cloud products, how they're built, and how you can use them. But really, it's all about the changes that are going on in software engineering, as told from the point of view of Google engineers. You can find the Google Cloud Platform podcast at gcppodcast.com. You'll hear from Googlers like Vint Cerf and all about TensorFlow and Firebase and BigQuery, from the high-level use cases to the low-level implementation. The GCP podcast has all of that covered. Find the Google Cloud Platform podcast at gcppodcast.com and subscribe to it wherever you get your podcasts. And by the way, if you ever see Lorenzo Alvisi, or if you, uh, if anybody listening ever sees him, you can pass on my gratitude for him passing me in college when I was on the verge of failing distributed systems and may not have graduated. So thanks to Professor Alvisi. I'll let him know he's a good friend. <laughs> okay, you know him. Yeah, That's yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> he's a brilliant guy. Very difficult to take a class from, at least for me. Some people, it didn't have a hard time. So I want to talk about some of your your writing and your research, and I want to get to Falcon eventually, which is a, a Bitcoin relay network. But first, I, to ease into that, because I think that's, that's a, a little bit more of a complex topic, there's a blog post that you wrote where you were auditing the decentralization of Bitcoin and Ethereum, because people take it for granted that these are decentralized blockchains with you know fairness and decentralization you were kind of eating away at some of the things that we take for granted so the first idea that you explored in this blog post is the idea that bitcoin underutilizes its network so bitcoin is a bunch of computers that are networked together they're consenting on transactions how could these computers be used more efficiently so I guess one thing in terms of that decentralization work, it, it's really, really looking at different aspects of decentralization and trying to see how we can quantify them. So I think what you said is, is, is correct, but we're really looking at 
at sort of trying to quantify these different aspects of decentralization arguments that people have made. Now, in particular for Bitcoin and utilizing its network, what we did was a comparative study where we said, where we looked at the bandwidth in 2016 and we looked at the bandwidth in 2017. And the bandwidth requirements of the protocol have remained the same. Whereas if we look at the actual nodes in the system, the bandwidth that they have allocated to sort of provisioning for Bitcoin has actually increased. So you can increase the block size. And and, and really what we are trying to advocate for here is let's take these measurements and decide our protocol parameters based on these measurements. So if we see that the Bitcoin, that the bandwidth of the Bitcoin, of the average Bitcoin node has gone up by a factor of two, we should increase the protocol bandwidth requirements by a factor of two. And and then, then we can now make sort of like these evidence-based decisions on what, what the protocol parameters are based on who is using the protocol actually. So it's like Moore's law and its correlates are continuing on. Our computers are getting better. They're getting higher bandwidth. Why wouldn't we increase the block size, for example, to impose more strain on the network because we have better hardware? Yeah, exactly. So so it's, it's that question. And the thing is, we've seen historically that the Bitcoin bandwidth has gotten better, but there's no reason to believe that it always will get better. It may be that at some point we see the average Bitcoin nodes bandwidth going down, in which case... At that point, you, the argument for block size decrease becomes much more compelling. And th- this can happen even with computers getting better because it depends on what computers are people using to run a Bitcoin nodes, right? Are you designing the Bitcoin protocol for, for your cell phone or are you designing the Bitcoin protocol for well-provisioned nodes that are run by, by major corporations? And which type of node is using your system will affect the design decisions that you make much more deeply than I think people have have been looking at. Another point that you explore in that blog post is that Ethereum is more decentralized than Bitcoin, but that's not saying much because neither of them are actually very decentralized. So are Ethereum and Bitcoin mining nodes, are these mostly just in large corporate mining farms? Like, is this basically an AWS type of situation? Yeah, uh, that's what it seems like. It's either mining farms or, or mining pools where you may not have all the mining nodes in sort of in, in located in one central location with, with cheap power. It may just be that there are many people who are buying mining rigs and then just pointing them to a mining pool instead. So, but yes, I think the right way to look at these miners is looking at them as sort of large sort of professional organizations rather than like sort of your mom and pop store that's like sort of just bought a Bitcoin miner and is mining by themselves, like in isolation. Well, uh, maybe Kodak will democratize that and make it more accessible to the mom and pops. Yeah, I'm not actually, I haven't been following that too closely. So I'm not, I see a lot of these news articles pop up on like, (laughs) on Twitter and everything. And I'm really like focused on sort of more of the science aspect of this. So I (laughs) I don't don't blame you. Yeah, well, like I read some of them because it's amusing, but I don't follow everything super closely. I don't blame you. Just, I think what, what Kodak announced was <laughs> they announced that they were going to issue a token and that they were going to like rent out mining rigs to people. So if you wanted to borrow a mining rig from Kodak, you can. But uh, let's, let's not talk about that. <laughs> let's, let's leave that to other podcasts. So Ethereum is more decentralized, though. You know, we, we've got, like you said, most of the mining power is in mining pools and mining farms. But Ethereum, according to your studies, is more decentralized. So why is Ethereum more decentralized? So the thing is, with decentralization, it's a tricky topic because you can't put a number on it. You can't say Ethereum is five decentralized and Bitcoin is seven decentralized and and therefore Bitcoin is better than Ethereum or Ethereum is better than Bitcoin. So in, in some aspects, so if we're looking at sort of full nodes that are running and validating the Ethereum and Bitcoin blockchains respectively, Ethereum is better distributed than Bitcoin. Like So if you're looking at sort of the physical 
decentralization of full nodes, Ethereum is more decentralized than Bitcoin. If you're looking at sort of the mining decentralization, it actually looks like Ethereum is a little more centralized than Bitcoin. But again, when we're looking at Ethereum versus Bitcoin, especially with mining, we're comparing like sort of shades of gray here. It's, it's, it, it very much is. They're both very, very centralized. And Ethereum is slightly more than Bitcoin, but, but, but neither one are really doing all that well in that metric. What are the dangers or the downsides of having these miners and these mining pools centralized? The biggest danger I see is, is transaction censorship. If you have a transaction that you need to get through and some miner doesn't like it, if miners have large amounts of hash power, they can actually delay your transaction from getting through. And this also opens up Bitcoin to different kinds of censorship too. If there are sort of, if you can contact, I think, less than 20 miners and get over 90% of the hash power, well, so any government that can do that now can say, all right, well, I want to censor this transaction and don't confirm it or we'll send the authorities on these 20 people. And now you're in sort of the same situation that you are already in, but in a more roundabout way. So, yeah, so I think that I think censorship is really the biggest issue I see with these mining or with mining centralization. And tell me if this is the way that censorship would carry out if it were to carry out. So, if you had a situation where, for example, 90% of the hash power, the problem-solving power of the Bitcoin network was dominated by a single power, a single you know mining pool, for example, the way that, that transactions are processed is all the pending transactions, like if I try to send you X Bitcoin for a cup of coffee then my transaction has to be processed by the Bitcoin network. And the way it gets processed is my transaction makes its way to a Bitcoin full node and it sits in the mempool. The mempool is the set of pending transactions. And then the Bitcoin miners get to choose which transactions they're going to put up for a candidate block. And they get to choose. They can choose whichever block, whichever set of transactions they want. And if they choose only the ones from people who are abiding by Chinese laws, for example, like if, if that's what they wanted to do, if they wanted to basically narrow their, the set of transactions that they were willing to accept, they could totally do that. And they could gain control of the financial system in that fashion. And if they could decide to only solve Bitcoin block puzzles for sets of transactions that are kosher, according to them. Is that the way that censorship would play out? That is one of the ways. Uh, it's hard to tell if like sort of this is the attack because I haven't really thought too much about it. But that definitely is a very plausible way for censorship to happen. And essentially, at, at best case, what that would do is that would prov- that would delay these non-kosher transactions from getting confirmed in a timely fashion. And at worst case, you can even think of if a miner has, say, 90% of the hash power, they could just refuse to build on a block that contains this non-kosher transaction. So they, they can actually start putting other miners out of business. That's a little more overt and a little easier to detect than just sort of these, this covert censorship attack. But either one is not really great for sort of the, the decentralized, the permissionless blockchains. And do you think that this discussion is a equivalent to a critique of proof of work and that this is kind of an indication that, you know, maybe proof of stake is going to be a, a good solution to this kind of potential censorship and centralization? Yeah. So I think what this work shows is that we very much are in the early stages. So it's not saying that Bitcoin or Ethereum or that permissionless blockchains have, fa- have failed. It's just these are literally some of the first systems that have that have been deployed and are using this technology. So of course, there's going to be some issues. And, and I think these more drastic redesigns, like proof of stake that you mentioned, are the things that need to be seriously considered. And they may help with, with this mining centralization problem. They may not. But I think the way I look at this is, let's try these things, see how they go. Let's measure the metrics that we care about. And then let's make technical decisions based on those metrics and sort of go from there. 
And so, by the way, this is a good place to bring up the fact that at Cornell, you actually have a Bitcoin network simulator. So you've got a bunch of computers that are set up to like resemble the Bitcoin network. Can you explain what that is? Yeah. So this was done by a senior student in our group. And essentially what my understanding is, um, I wasn't super intimately involved with this project, but, but what my understanding is that you have a bunch of VMs that are running in a cluster downstairs and their internode latencies, their internode latencies and bandwidths are what we measured from the actual Bitcoin network. So it's a one-to-one the simulation of the actual Bitcoin network. Okay, well, maybe I'll I'll have to do a show with your fellow researcher. That, that, that sounds like a pretty interesting topic. So to get into the work you're doing with Falcon, this is a a research proposal. I would I guess is probably the right way to say it for a different way of doing networking in Bitcoin, or not necessarily a different way, but an augmentation to the Bitcoin network to accelerate block propagation. And I think we should just start with, you know, maybe refreshing people on the simple process of a transaction. So a simple Bitcoin transaction, I send Bitcoin to you to pay for a cup of coffee. I want to write that transaction to the Bitcoin ledger. Explain how that works today and maybe some of the frictions that go along in that process. Yeah, of course. So first, that transaction gets broadcast to everyone in the network, and it goes in the mempool, like you said before on the show. And then after that, the miners will take a group of transactions that they care about and and want to put in the next block, and they will then solve that block. Now, all of this kind of is fine as is, and Falcon doesn't play a very active role in this process. However, once the miner has solved a block, there now is a danger of another miner solving a block. I guess thinking about how how block solving works is a good way of seeing why this is a problem. So how block solving works is you guess a number and you hash that number, and you basically are trying to figure out a number whose hash is very small. And because these hashes are are cryptographically secure, doing this is very, very hard. And that's what essentially proof of work is. So if you can show me that you found a number whose hash is very small, I assume you tried many, many times to find such a number. So now the thing is when a block is mined, it means that miner has found this magic number. So the risk is if that block propagation takes a very long time, so now imagine that block propagation takes two minutes, right? What that means is in those two minutes, some other miner could also have guessed and solved another block at the same height. And now this creates a conflict, which basically means one of those miners is out of luck. And one of their blocks will make it on the chain and and the other block will not. And essentially what this does is it makes the chain less secure because one of the miners will have essentially wasted their time and wasted their work, right? So this does a lot of bad things for both the miners and for the security of the chain as a whole. And how block block propagation works in the traditional peer-to-peer model is when, when the miner mines this block, they send it to their peers who then will validate every transaction in the block. And then they'll send it on to their to their neighbors. And then eventually you kind of hope that the block will get propagated to enough people so that no one else solves a block at the same time that you, that you do. And that process is very slow. And that actually, in classical networking, that's, that's, that's the store and forward model. Except here, kind of the store and and the forwarding process takes a very, very long time because you have to check all these signatures on these transactions. So just to recap what you said, so you've got these different full nodes that are competing on what is essentially a linear search for a solution. And once they find a solution, so you've got these nodes that are competing on a linear search, 
And there are multiple solutions that could be found. There are alternative solutions. It's not like there's just one solution. I mean, they could be setting solving for different sets of transactions, or maybe there there are multiple nonces that end up hashing to the same or end up also hashing to different to different solutions. And so you can end up with essentially a race condition where two nodes come across a solution at the same time, and then it's a race to see which node can propagate that their new block faster. And that just leads to a lot of wasted work. It can lead to just conflicts in the chain. How often does that happen? Does it happen on a regular basis where you have two nodes or two mining pools that find competing alternate solutions? So I don't recall what the number was for Bitcoin before relay networks came on the scene. So in in Bitcoin from our measurement study, it happens less than half a percent of the time. On Ethereum, though, which does not have this relay network, but they also run their network at a much higher, they push their network much more than Bit than Bitcoin does. So the numbers also aren't exactly comparable. But in Ethereum, that number is about 6%. And it can actually go up. So it can get pretty bad. Because they have a lower block time, right? Yeah, so, so, so they have a lower block time. They're producing blocks. So yeah, they, they have a lower block time, which, which also probably plays a role in the high number. But in Bitcoin, I think it was a couple percent, if I remember correctly. But yeah, I'm not quite sure. Software Engineering Daily is brought to you by Consensus. Do you think blockchain technology is only used for cryptocurrency? Think again. Consensus develops tools and infrastructure to enable a decentralized future built on Ethereum, the most advanced blockchain development platform. Consensus has hundreds of Web3 developers that are building decentralized applications, focusing on world-changing ideas like creating a system for self-sovereign identity, managing supply chains, developing a more efficient electricity provider, and much more. So, listeners, why continue to build the internet of today when you can build the internet of the future on the blockchain? Consensus is actively hiring talented software developers to help build the decentralized web. Learn more about Consensus projects and open source jobs at consensus.net slash se daily. That's C O N S E N S Y S dot net slash S E daily. Consensus.net slash S E daily. Thanks again, Consensus. So this Falcon network that we're going to get to, so this is not just work that's relegated to Bitcoin. This is more like in any proof of work system, this could accelerate and improve the the security of the network. I think I'd actually say something stronger. I think this actually will help any consensus algorithm. Because in any Byzantine consensus algorithm, the latency of the network sort of plays a critical role in performance and time it takes to converge and and decide on a value. In Bitcoin, we're talking about this wasted work and everything, right? So, 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 So these are sort of bad things that happen in proof of work. In other consensus protocols, there are other bad things that happen. But again, like it's a different set of bad things depending on the consensus protocol. But a faster network is good in general. So this isn't just applicable to proof of work. It's applicable to kind of everything, kind of to all consensus protocols. So let's say, you know, we're talking about Ethereum, because I think that's, like you said, that's a better real world case. If 6% of the time you have competing chains that develop, and that's essentially, that means that two nodes or two mining pools are competing to to lay claim to the reward, the block reward for verifying a set of transactions. That means you you uh, you essentially have competition and and even more wasted work because now there's going to be so so six percent of the time there is a is that a soft fork? Is that what would you would call it? No, it's not a soft fork. It's a pruned block, or in, in Ethereum block. it's okay. called yeah, it, it, or in Ethereum it's called an uncle block. A soft fork is is sort of when the features of the underlying blockchain change. Soft forks and hard forks are are different from these, but from like sort of from this problem. 
Right. Okay. So listeners, keep in mind my error there that this is not, we're not talking about forks here. We're talking about, so pruned blocks. So we're talking about two rivaling versions of the transaction history and one of those is going to lose, and that version of history is going to get pruned. Is that what what you would say? It, it's, it's a block that's going to get pruned. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So basically, one of the problems here that I think, in some sense, you're not presenting a solution to to rivaling blocks being created. That's just you know, that's still going to be a feature of your proof of work system with with Falcon within it. But what you are trying to suggest is a faster way of block propagation. So that if somebody finds a solution to a block, you want to notify the the rest of the network faster so that that delta between person A finding a solution to a block and person B finding a competing solution, you want to reduce that delta because if you can propagate that block to person B faster, then person B is going to give up on looking for a different solution. So this is, you are trying to accelerate block propagation. Is that correct? Yes. It's not as competitive as I would say. Like I think miners generally, what they really want to do is they want to mine at the end of the longest chain that they know of, right? Because that's sort of how this protocol makes progress. And they're more likely to get paid more if they mine on the chain with the most work, which is the longest chain. So yeah, so if person B hears about the block, then they'll start mining on top of it instead of mining at the previous block, which will produce a competing block, which can produce a competing block so so that something gets pruned. One strategy for accelerating the block propagation is relaying. So you can have nodes in the network that are specifically devoted to pushing out updates to the blockchain. They're relaying blocks. Explain what a relay node does. Yeah. So a relay node, like, yes, exactly what you said. The purpose in life for a relay node is to relay these blocks very, very quickly to everyone else in the network. Now, how these relay nodes achieve it is it depends on the individual relay network. So what Fa- what Falcon does in particular is, f- so first of all, it doesn't validate every transaction in the block. So it, it doesn't do a full block validation. It, it just partially validates the proof of work of forwarding on the block. And also the second trick that Falcon uses is cut through routing, which is a very age old trick in networking, which basically says, instead of waiting for the full packet to arrive in a network, you send the bytes as you get them. And Falcon does the exact same thing, but with Bitcoin blocks. So instead of waiting for the full block to arrive, you just pass on the bytes as soon as you get them. And what that does is each relay hop that you take, instead of each hop waiting for the full block to arrive and then forwarding it on, you actually just forward them on. So essentially, you parallelize the transmission across each hop. So each hop only adds a very minuscule amount of validation time instead of having this store and forward approach. And how do you validate the proof of work if you don't have the full transmission? Good question. The proof of work is that magic number that I said is only found on the block header, which is the first 104 bytes. Yeah, which is the first uh, 104 bytes of the block. So the second I receive that first 104 bytes, I actually can tell, was there a lot of work put into finding this block header? If that's true, then I forward on the block. So could someone give me a bad block with a bad transaction in it afterwards? Sure. But it would cost them quite a bit to do it. And, and they only get to broadcast one block's worth of transactions to, to the network. So it's it's a very high cost for very little denial of service if they're trying to use it as a denial of service vector. There have been relay networks before. I believe the Bitcoin Fast Relay Network is is one of them. Is your main improvement on that the the cut through routing, or are there other improvements that you've made? The cut through routing is the main improvement. The Bitcoin Relay Network's successor, Bitcoin Fiber, also uses cut through routing. So cut through routing is, I think, one of the Falcon's core contributions to the relay network space. Yes. 
Interesting. Now, how many relay nodes are there on the Bitcoin network? And and who is, by the way, who is incentivized to make these relay nodes? Because it seems like a very charitable thing to spin up a, a, a relay node because you're not, you know, you know, you could be using that node for hash power. Yeah, exactly. So you bring up a very good point. So for Bitcoin, the current state is I have 10 relay nodes that we run. Um, so Cornell is running the, the Falcon network and then B- Bitcoin Fiber is, is another relay network. So, so Falcon has 10 nodes. I think the Bitcoin relay network has five or six. So you're looking at maybe 20 nodes in total. But the, the second part that you bring up is actually very interesting, which is why are we incentivized to do this? And, and, and actually, this is a follow-on project to Falcon that ha- hasn't been announced yet. But so we're actually b- building a, another relay network, which is more j- general purpose than than Falcon. So Falcon is built for Bitcoin. This relay network is going to be built for pretty much any consensus protocol that wants to use it. It's the aim is to be trustless, and it's also a commercial enterprise. So it charges a fee for using it. And also it's trustless, which means that these cryptocurrencies can now rely on the relay network for performance. So in in Bitcoin, after Falcon and, and Fiber showed up, they can increase the block size quite drastically even, um, and they can process at much higher throughputs. However, then it kind of puts the relay networks in this awkward situation of if the relay network decides I want to censor this transaction or I want to censor this block, they have a lot of power. So this next project, um, which we're calling the block route, is really a trustless version of Falcon so that it's not put in this centralized situation that, that Falcon would be if people started designing protocols, assuming that they have this relay network. So that's really what the core insights are behind this next project that we're doing. Well, depending on what kind of commercialization you're going towards, uh, you can sign me up for your ICO or your pre-sale. So, so this attempted an enterprise, I'm sorry, a, well, yeah, an, an enterprise like a pay-to-play Falcon network that is trustless does this overlap with your research into into consortium blockchains? Because I mean, you would need to have a customer to pay for the for that network. You know, I can't imagine. I mean, Bitcoin or Ethereum, if they wanted to use that, there would need to be some agreement within the network to use that kind of thing. I mean, so I, I'm tr- I'm I'm trying to imagine who would the customer be for this kind of pay to play Falcon network. Yeah, so we have a large set of incentives kind of worked out, but it's not so much as like a pay to play thing as what Blockstart really does is it kind of makes a decision on each network. It decides, do I serve this network or not? And and that's really the only decision that the Blockstart network can make. And now if it makes a decision to serve a network, the high level idea is, for some number of transactions per second, which is going to be higher than what we are at today, of course, it's going to be sort of a free as a trial run kind of thing. And then if you want to push it up into very, very high transaction throughputs, and we're we're targeting thousands of transactions, but again, we need to demonstrate this on an actual network first, at least on our on our experiments to show that this is possible, but we're aiming for thousands of transactions. And to get there, some of the transactions will have to subsidize the relay network. And the idea is with so much capacity, you actually bring down the costs for everyone. So it's we're really trying to aim for a, for a world where the miners, the users, and the network is are all better off than they are today, and that's really like what we're aiming for. It's not we're not trying to sort of extort money out of a permissionless blockchains or something. So it's, we were really looking at it as in that way, and and we're really looking to sort of. I, I think the commercial enterprise, I think, is is a good idea just because it provides a level of support that, that individuals running the relay networks can't do. And you can start doing much cooler things on top of them, on top of an, an enterprise-backed relay network than you can with a grad student-backed relay network. <laughs> okay. That makes sense. So I know we're nearing the end of our time. 
you know, one thing I <laughs> I found in my conversation with with Joseph Bono was that when you ask somebody who is very measured and diplomatic and a very deep thinker in this space for some heretical thoughts like what are the thi- like I asked I think I asked him some questions about like you know things that he believes about cryptocurrencies that are heretical or that most people you know if he w- walked into a bitcoin conference what would most people disagree with him on uh, and he gave me some really interesting answers so I- I'd love to ask you essentially the same thing are there things in the cryptocurrency world where maybe you see them on Twitter all the time or you see them in blog posts and they're just taken as these dogmas where you're like, no, that's just not the case. Things that you disagree with most people on that you can tell me about. I I think a lot of the disagreements that I would have actually are put in the the decentralization of blog posts and paper, which is that these systems are really the version one. And I think there's a lot of the dogma in some communities around like the way, the way we have things now are sort of perfect and we don't want to touch or change anything. And I think that's probably the thing I disagree with the most. And I think this is really the version one of these protocols and you're going to start seeing blockchains that look very different. And in 10 years, will we still be, will the blockchain design look very different than what Bitcoin and Ethereum look like today? Yes, I, I think that's true. And I think embracing that change is something that some communities don't do. But I think, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I have anything that's like particularly dogmatic or controversial, like, like outside of that, though. It's, it's more like just, I try to keep an open mind about these things and because I've seen surprising things happen with like with business models or ideas that I'm like, there's no possible way this can work. And then it turned into something big. Like when Bitcoin first came out, I wasn't really quite sure what to think of it. I obviously wasn't in grad school and sort of knee deep in, in, in understanding this stuff well. But I thought I'm like this seems like this seems like it would be just a like a passing fad, and now, like five years later or so, I'm in I'm like in the cryptocurrency space, knee deep, super excited about it. So I think I've been wrong enough times to not hold too many dogmatic beliefs. Yeah, I mean, when I was some very early shows I did in this space, I interviewed some Bitcoin people who were very sophisticated, and then I talked to some casually on the side as well, and I was kind of convinced by what they said that Ethereum was never going to work, that this was just a a, a disaster, and it was going to end in tears, and and that's obviously not been the case thus far. I mean, it, and it's just, you know, I guess you, you got to take everything with a grain of salt, and I don't know, it's a hard area to assess, but... But, but yeah, I think the last thing, I, I do think this area has a lot of promise, though, and I can see sort of these problems in how we do things today that this area has potential to address. So that front, I remain very optimistic about this area. Well, Sumya, thanks for coming on the show. It's been great. We talked about a lot of different stuff, and I'm I'm sure you know having you on in the future would be great. I think this is going to be a popular episode, and maybe as your research develops around consortium blockchains, we can do do another show on that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'd be happy to. It was great being on the show. Yeah, I didn't notice the time flying. <laughs> okay, well, that's great to hear. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Great to hear. We are running an experiment to find out if Software Engineering Daily listeners are above average engineers. At triplebyte.com slash sedaily, you can take a quiz to help us gather data. I took the quiz and it covered a wide range of topics. General programming ability, a little security, a little system design. It was a nice short test to measure how my practical engineering skills have changed since I started this podcast. I will admit, although I've gotten better at talking about software engineering, I have definitely gotten worse at actually writing code and doing software engineering myself. But if you want to check out that quiz yourself and help us gather data, you can take that quiz at triplebyte.com slash sedaily. And in a few weeks, we're going to take a look at the results and we're going to find out if SE Daily listeners are above average. And if you're looking for a job, TripleByte is a great place to start your search, fast-tracking you at hundreds of top tech companies. 
TripleByte takes engineers seriously and does not waste their time. I recommend checking it out at triplebyte.com slash se daily. That's triple b y t e dot com slash se daily. Thank you, Triple Byte, for being a sponsor. Wow. 